Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live. And uh, message today, Gog of Magog. And uh, this has been a battle I've been alluding to in some of my more recent videos, uh, speaking to you that it is more going to be like an extraterrestrial battle. Uh, and we can even prove that from the Dead Sea Scrolls. But really, who is Gog of Magog? And is Israel involved right now uh, in creating a Gog of Magog battle, uh, bringing Russia down, uh, Iran over from the east and everything to make it appear as biblical prophecy is being fulfilled? And, of course, oddly enough, you may find it strange to know that they control these different global leaders to such a point that they can create wars. This is such a complex message today, friends. I don't even begin to even know how to really lay it out to where we can truly understand it. But I'm going to do everything I can uh, to do that to the best of my ability. I have here on the screen here, Rabbi uh, Ariel Tzedak, uh, who wrote uh, this one book. I forget the name of the book. I don't have it in front. Angels and Demons, I believe, something to that effect there. But he actually speaks about that Israel's help is going to come from within the earth. And he even says in another one of his broadcasts there, of course, he's on the History Channel here, uh, he speaks about that if you see a golden reptilian hand, don't be afraid. They're your ally. They're your friend. Uh, something along that lines there. And so it's a very, very scary thing when you see rabbis that kind of uh, speak about reptilian entities as being friends for the Jewish people. But it really is it strange. Well, if you recognize who the sons of darkness are, maybe it's not as strange as it might appear. Because quite frankly, there is a biblical showdown coming. Jesus even says in Matthew chapter 23, calls them uh, the Pharisees, serpents and vipers, or a generation of vipers, in fact. And oddly enough, that's exactly what we see in modern day orthodoxy, they claim to be the descendants of the Pharisees. And again, I always say this as a disclaimer. I do not say that every Pharisee or every Jew is a reptilian or a serpent. I don't believe that for not even for a moment. In fact, we are descendant of Jewish people ourselves in our own family here. So it's not that we feel that way there, but there is a bloodline that is carried over, that's coming through, that is going to wage war on Christianity. One of the reasons why we expose the Noahide laws, these seven quote-unquote Noahide laws that will bring about the beheading of humanity, beheading, not just humanity, well, humanity, yes, but also of Christians. In fact, uh, when we look at the book of Revelation chapter 20, and, and, and oddly enough, that goes into your Gog of Magog battle as well. Notice what it says, verse 3, And cast him into the bottom of spit. Well, let's just read the, from verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the, on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. That actually, that Greek word is thousands, plural, but an unspecified amount of time. And he cast him into a bottomless pit, shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. Now, my particular conjecture on this right here is that there, there's no bottomless pit on the earth. I feel like he was put into another dimension. And that seal is kind of like the ether. He wasn't able to pass over. And it allowed uh, the Christianity, the believers of Jesus, to be able to flourish and to be able to really get a stronghold before he got loosed again. And it says here that he was shut up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be finished or thousands of years be uh, fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Now notice, you got all this going on. It says in verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. Well, the antecedent there to the ones that, you know, 
In other words, they were beheaded for, for, for their witness of Jesus. And it's because of what? Those that were sitting upon these throne and judgments given unto them. Wow. Now, there's another scripture, and I don't have it up here right now, and I can't recall exactly where it's at. But again, it talks about where, you know, this, you know, Satan basically has handed over the power for that short period of time. It says, and for the word of God, and for and, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither has received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Or again, that's in the plural, thousands of years. Now, the beheading has been going on since the days of John the Baptist, we know, in Israel. And that's one of the reasons why you see this here. These are people that have died. They've, they've come back. And there's been those that have been sitting on thrones, and they have doing just exactly that, bringing about judgment. Herod judged John, had his head taken. James' head was taken off as well. But here in the last days, it's really going to, really going to go wild. And easily, when you look at the seven Noahide laws, if you break those laws, and one of those laws is that you can't believe that Jesus Christ is the divine Son of God, that is the law of blasphemy, then off with your head. That's ex exactly the way that law happens to be worded out there. All right, so now, the big issue comes here, as I said, and also in Revelation chapter 20, we also are dealing with the time of the Gog of Magog battle. Uh, verse 7 and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of, uh, out, of, out of his prison, or thousands, again, is loosed out of his prison. Again, we're at that time frame. It's like they're repeating the time frame here. And shall go out to deceive the nations where, uh, which are in the four quarters of the earth. Now that's interesting in itself. He goes out to deceive the nations, the Gentiles. Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So he brings, he brings Gog and Magog, Gog and Magog to gather them together to that battle. There is the sand of the sea. Bring them back for a battle there in Israel. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. Notice who's the one that has actually become the victims of this battle. Now, the Jewish people always take, and they take you to Ezekiel. We'll pull it up. We've got it already up here for you anyway. Ezekiel 38. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And I will turn you about, and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you forth in all your army. Horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in gorgeous, great uh, company with buckler and shield, and all of them handling swords. Persia, Cush, Put, and with them, and with, with shield and helmet, and Gomer, and all his bands in the house of Togamah, and the uttermost parts of the north, and all his bands, even many peoples with you. And be you prepared, and prepare for yourself, uh, prepare for, for, for yourself, you and all your company that are assembled unto you, and, and thou be a guard of them. After many days thou shalt be mustered for service, in the latter years thou shalt come against the land that is brought back from the sword." that is gathered out of many peoples against the mountains of Israel, which have been continual waste, but is brought forth out of the peoples, and they dwell safely, all of them. And you shall ascend, and you shall come like a storm, and you shall be like a cloud to cover the land, you and all thy bands, and many peoples with you. So this war is, is put together, and if we take and couple that with the book of Revelation, we realize that the war is really against the saints. It's, it's against the, the true Israel of God, which, make, which is both Jew and Gentile alike that make up that body of Christ. And in fact, if you look at 1 Peter, uh, let's see. A stumbling stone, we're in chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, a, a stone of stumbling, talking about Christ, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But you are chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of what? Out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
Now focus on that word darkness right there because we know in the Dead Sea Scrolls they use the term of the sons of darkness. And that's the battle that's going to be waged forth right there. Now, so we want to take, I want to uh, take, let's see, we got over here John 2. Uh, yeah, another one here. John, in John's Gospel there, chapter 12, I am come a light into the world, Jesus says here, that whosoever believes on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hears my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I come not to judge the world, but to save the world. He knew judgment would come later. He's not, he wasn't here the first time around to bring about judgment upon this world. All right, so we, we see this here. We see that there is this Gog of Magog battle that's going to take place there, right? Ezekiel brings it out. In fact, if you go all the way, going on down through there, he goes and saying, God unto God, thus saith the Lord in that day when my people Israel dwell safely, thou shalt not know it. And again, we find out revelation. You couple it together. Israel is the, is the royal priesthood. But then Ezekiel goes on to say, and you shall come forth from your place out of the uttermost parts of the north. You and many peoples with you, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And you shall come against my people Israel as a cloud to cover the land. And everybody keeps saying it's Russia, 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 Russia. Well, you know, if you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, we find out right here, for example, here, and this is in the, um, I believe, yeah, in the Genesis part of the scroll there. You shall carry out the sentence on Gog and on all his gathering that has, that has gathered to him. Now watch this now. <laughs> all right. You shall carry out a sentence on Gog and on all of his gathering that has gathered to him. For you shall wage war against them from the heavens upon them for confusion. For there is a multitude of holy ones in heaven and a host of angels in your holy dwelling to praise uh, your truth. And the chosen ones of the holy nation you have established for yourself among them. The book of the names of all their armies is with you in your holy dwelling and the number of the just in your glorious dwelling. Your blissful mercies and covenant of your peace you engraved for them with the chisel of life in order to rule during all the times of eternal, to muster armies of your chosen ones according to its thousands and myriads together with your holy ones and with your angels to have the upper hand in the battle and destroy the rebels of earth uh, in the lawsuit of your judgments while the nations of the chosen ones have triumphed. That's important to know, and we're actually going to go further back up in this particular scroll right here. But what I wanted you to be able to see is that Gog was not alone. Gog and all has gathered that has gathered to him. The question is, though, is where is Gog? And then we're going to get into those that are gathered to him and who Gog really is. In the Qumran scroll, the war scroll here, if you read in here, it says... And in his time he will go out with his great rage to wage war against the kings of the north, and his anger wants to exterminate and cut off the horn of Israel. And this is the time of salvation for the nation of God. you got a blank spot there. The lot of Belial, Belial being Satan, there will be a great panic among the sons of Japheth, Asher, shall fall, and there will be no help for him. The rule of the Kedim will come to an end, wickedness having been defeated with no remnant remaining, and there will be no escape for all the sons of darkness. There you have it right there. There will be no escape for the sons of darkness. And the sons of justice shall shine to all the edges of the earth. They shall go on shining up to the end of all the periods of, uh, of darkness, and in the time of God has exalted greatness will shine for all the eternal times for peace and blessing, glory and joy. Anybody who knows anything about Japheth knows this is where God comes from. He comes from that lineage. All right? That's very important to know. Now, if we go back, though, um, and we look at Gog, and I'm just trying to think here if I've, where I've got this at.
it's not wanting to actually let it move for me at this point here um, I actually have a map for it though because there the description that is given to where Gog actually is in the Dead Sea Scrolls and let me just find the right mapping in here is basically Western Turkey and even going northward um, and if when you go northward you end up into the uh, Khazarian Empire all right this here Lyd Lydia is one of the places that it mentions about Gog's uh, or Magog where the land of Magog actually set there would be Western uh, Turkey uh, but then as, J as Japheth talks about giving the different properties to his children, which Magog being one of those, it goes north of the Black Sea, like I said, even going up into uh, this area here, what is what is known as the Khazarian Empire. So when we see the prophecy about what is going to happen in this war, and then we find out that Gog literally let me pull the right one back here gathering that has gathered to him see then we go into a blank spot but he actually gathers to him now let me just make sure here because i also have um that's a different part right there he gathers to him he's gathering people to battle and of course that battle is against as we as i point out again i want to just make sure we make this very important that you understand that it's against the saints all right they're going to go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth satan does gog and magog to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea you literally are looking at a battle between you know the true heavenly father and satan and satan his minions here on earth and, and it truly takes the Father to come down to intervene because if he doesn't, there's not going to be anybody left. But they go out and deceive the nations. Remember me telling you about CIA, NSA, Mossad controlling certain ministries and those ministries all put their focus on the Jewish state, the Israeli state right now? And, and just think about it, right? And, and, and since when in history have we ever had uh, you know, such an outcry of what's going on in the Middle East there right now that Netanyahu's government is being likened to that of a theocracy. Um, let me just pull that up here. Actually, the, the video, or excuse me, the article that Yana wrote has got far more evidence to go with it. Uh, you know, and, and it's just, uh, it's, in the news just constantly right now uh you know that you know as far as the protest against the right-wing government in israel uh and it's mainly they're, they're stripping women of their rights uh and let me just pull you up let me just take you here to, to our website here yana's latest article that she wrote on this on our website the threat of newly formed right-wing israeli government a warning to christians when you go into this article right here and you read about it, you will find out exactly what they're planning on doing. And, you know, everything she backs up uh, with the sources to go with it. Like in the case here, Israel National News. Netanyahu promises Talmud will be Israeli law. And that was that was back in 2014. I've, I shared with you from the intel that I got that uh, that we know that Israel will be the head of the new world order. Uh, and, and, and in this article, she has so much information. Uh, this one here, uh, she quotes from Haaretz, Israeli government promotes bill to expand rabbinical courts jurisdiction powers. You know, I mean, the, the, listen, Christians may not get it, but I guarantee you one thing, Israelis get what's going on over there right now. She says here, the Times of Israel's article published the warning of Tel Aviv's mayor, uh, uh, Ron Haladi, that Israel is changing from democracy to a fascist theocracy, he says. All right. Uh, she goes on, the newspaper Haaretz published another article on February 6, 2023, explaining that the newly formed Israeli far-right 
government wants to establish fully uh, patriarchy rules and uh, misogynism. And she gives you the article here. Israel's new Netanyahu-led misogynist government. Right there on Haaretz putting it out. You know, this is a very dangerous situation to, to the core. Now, as Israel sets this up, why are they setting this up in the first place? Well, they're taking it from, from the biblical passage, and I don't know if I have it on this computer. I think I have it on the other computer. Um, hmm. Yeah, because I still have, or wait, maybe, maybe, no, it's not that one there either. It is actually, give me one second, because I can pull it up real quick from over here. Where I had it over here. Yeah, Zechariah. Um, no, that's actually not either. Okay. No, that's not that one either. Isaiah chapter 2. Is that where it's at? Let's see. Yeah, in Isaiah chapter 2. Let me pull that up on the screen for you guys here because I'm using two different computers to compile everything here. So I got things kind of spread out. I thought I had everything together in one, but I don't. Isaiah chapter 2. And many people shall go and say, Come and let us go up into the mountain of the Lord to the house of God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That is the very reason why they are so rampantly putting together all these laws in Israel, this far right wing government, like I said, it's not going to change, friends. It is only going to get worse. But on top of that, at the same time, Netanyahu is telling the world that a Gog and Magog war is coming. And and I'll tell you something. I used to think to myself the only way that Putin would actually attack Israel is if his hand was forced into it. In fact, I know through Israeli intel and everything that they have threatened Putin. They have told him straight up that if he, does, if he gets in the way when they go to attack Iran, that they will destroy his base in Latvia, uh, and that they would destroy Russian soldiers that are stationed throughout Syria, that they are to stand down and not to get in the way. I've actually seen those very things coming out of Israeli intelligence and things like that. And so, you know, and, and, and you know, we already see that Putin has not been afraid to go in and try to rescue the the Jews of Eastern Ukraine, or at least that's the way it appears on face value. Not Jews, I'm sorry, but the Russians, the, the ethnic Russians of Eastern Ukraine. And so my thought was too, knowing that there's two million ethnic Russians that are considered to be Jews living in the state of Israel, if if Israel were to attack the base of Latkia inside of uh, uh, Syria that Russia has there, maybe Putin would then get angry enough to go in after, uh, after the Jewish people. But then I begin... I begin to really dig deeper into what's happening here, knowing full well that the Chabad organization has such a powerful control and an influence on everything that happens around the globe. Uh, I started digging and I remembered Edward Hudo. Uh, and, uh, and with Edward Hudo, I knew that, uh, that, that he had also brought out the control of the Chabad organization because he was a, 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 a a member of the Chabad organization as a rabbi of Kharkiv, uh, Ukraine, uh, where he is actually from. So I want to take and I want to share some of that with you here. I'm going to, I'm trying to get some things a little bit out of the way here before I do here. So let's see, let's pull back over. Uh, that's what I was looking for right here. Uh, oh, by the way, this here is a map and all these little dots that you see on here represent Chabad organizations and where they are globally. There are over 10,000 Chabad organizations globally. Uh, and I thought just out of giggles and laughs there, uh, 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 you know, besides the Arabic countries like Libya and Egypt and Algeria and Tanzania and Nigeria, places like that, there are no Chabad organizations there. Israel, they're just everywhere. As you can see, you zoom into Israel there. Uh, Chabad definitely controls Israel. That's one of the reasons why uh, they can easily influence what's going to happen in Israel and totally control the entire country, hands down. Uh, but they also control Russia. They control Europe uh, and Moscow. Look at Moscow, at the, at the number of the Chabad organizations in Moscow alone, everywhere in the city there. Um, 
you know. So, but in the United States, I'm sitting there looking. Norway, oddly enough, there's no report inside of Norway. So if you live in, in Europe, Norway may be a good place to live, or Iceland even for that matter. But you come to the United States, and of course, they're in every single state with the exception of one state. And, I, and even if you look it up online, Wyoming is the only state where there's not a Chabad organization. And you might think, well, what, what difference does it make? Well, you know, if it comes just to freedom of religion, you'd be right. What difference would it make? But where the difference comes in is the control that Chabad has on every aspect of life with every single government entity, you name it, they control everyone. Even to the case when uh, President Biden uh, when he came in, this is on uh, the JewishWoman.org. To whom does a U.S. president bow? President Biden, kneeling, represented so much to me. A mother of nine uh, says this here uh, in this in this particular article here. And this here is uh, let's see, her name is Rivka. Wait a minute, I think it's, it's yeah, Rivka uh, Ravitz. Rivka Ravitz, who is the uh, Israeli President Ruvlin Rivlin's chief of staff. And when they came and visited the White House, she kneeled, or excuse me, President Biden kneeled before her. And to me, this was much more serious than you could ever imagine. And the reason being is to me, it was that she was a type of the, of the, uh, of the matriarch of Israel and the 12 tribes of Israel. And it was a sign, and of course she is a Chabad Jewish Jewish woman to begin with. So therefore, he showed his loyalty in that. And not only him, you have many many others that do this as well, as I've shared with you before. You know, all you have to do if you want to look it up, President, um, um, and put U.S. and Chabad. Every year, every president in the United States signs the Menachem Schneerson's uh, uh, laws into into being there, right? And uh, there you have George Bush right there doing it. Uh, you have uh, you have you'll have you you know it doesn't matter what the president is. Ronald Reagan, there you have Ronald Reagan signing those Noahide laws. Uh, Bush, there you can see him a little bit better in that picture there. Uh, you've got uh, Barack Obama. You know, every single one, this is the most political organization controlling world governments in the entire world. There you have Donald Trump. So don't think Donald Trump is not controlled. In fact, his daughter, Ivanka, is uh, is a representative of Chabad. It wasn't that she converted to Judaism. You'll learn about that here in just a little bit here. All right, so let me move on, though. This here, this is uh, from some of the writings of Edward Houdot, who is a, uh, Edward Hudo is, let me show you who, who he is. Um, this is Edward right here in a video here that he did here. So, uh, and, and he's going in here and he's explaining about some things here. I've got a couple of videos of his up. Um, he talks about the different wars and this one here, he's talking about Iraq and how that it was Israel that got us to go to war with Iraq. And the reason they did is because they wanted the artifacts there. Uh, that's true. Even the body of Nimrod, uh, they're in full control of the body of Nimrod right now, which is in below Colorado, uh, where they're trying to put a soul back in the body of Nimrod. But uh, they wanted some of the ancient documentation. He goes into that. He also talks about um, Ivanka Trump and, and her control of the White House. But my big question was, though, because of the Gog of Magog war, and everybody is really, all the ministers are pumping out to the people that... Russia is going to attack Israel eventually. Russia, Iran, they'll all come together and they'll go against Israel. And that may very well be so. But the thing is, is do not think that they're attacking Israel because they hate the Jewish people. It will be because the Khazarian Empire is the Gog of Magog. And the Khazarian Empire, as I just showed you, they bring with them, they are gathered, that was gathered to him, of Gog, are going to be all these enemies there. They will bring the ones that they have control of to come against Israel. Uh, and in this case here, it's not the Israel that we hear of today of the Orthodox community, but rather the true saints of God. And that will be in a global scale, not just in the little country in the Middle East there, but everywhere. And that's where your beheadings will begin to take place there. So my big question was, how 
badly then is Putin controlled, if this really be the case. And, and not only that, um, like I said, too, you know, you have two. Uh, oh, I don't want to pull that out as of yet. Uh, yeah, Leviathan with the hook there. There's a lot to be said about that there. I don't know if I'll get to all of this. Let's just get into this real quick here. The institution of the presidency. Uh, I heard. I first heard about, and this is Mr. Hudo is talking about, he's speaking himself. I first heard about Vladimir Putin during an official visit to Israel in 1997. By invitation of the Israeli foreign ministry, I along with then Vice Governor uh, of Kharkiv, uh, Oblast uh, Leonid Stavosky, visited Israel as part of the program of economic cooperate, economic cooperation between our countries. Uh, he goes on to say, among them was a planned meeting with the president of the new Entrepreneurs Association of Israel, Radishakovich. At that time, former Leningrad immigrant Yitzhak Radakovich had already become a heavyweight figure, not only in his own country, but according to rumors, in the corridors of the World Bank as well. Our meeting during the course of which the matter of various investments, pro projects, and uh, Kharkiv region were discussed was extremely official in nature. The same can't be said about our second meeting with Radakovich, uh, with whom we, upon returning to Ukraine, found ourselves in the same airplane. For the entire length of the flight from Tel Aviv to, to Kiev, we chatted on various topics. And of course, our chat, he mentioned in passing that his second cousin, Vladimir Putin, had great prospects for advancement in the Russian political elite. By August of 1999, I saw with my own eyes the result of the dizzling career of the therefore unknown Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. Let's refresh our memories of the chronology. Of course, 1999, he becomes the Prime Minister of the Russian Federation. He's appointed to be president in the year of January 2000. In March of 2000, he's elected to the Russian Federation as the president of Russia and has remained so in power ever since. Um, he goes on to say, Abra, um, uh, to what or rather to whom was Russia indebted for her successor to the throne? In the form of Vladimir Putin, we all know to whom, Boris Abram Abramovich Bervasky, uh, uh, who built up the new pretender to Russia's presidential throne in record time, and the indomitable Boris Abram uh, Abramovich searched long and hard for a potential successor, he took his time. He says, you see, the successor would be obligated to preserve family traditions and guarantee Tsar Boris complete immunity after his uh, uh, ab uh, uh, abdication. The family, he says, refers not just to Yelston and his extended family, but the network of criminal oligarch clans tied to the Russia's first president. Okay, now dropping down a little further. Abramovich Bravosky annoyance presidential elections also presupposed the participation of the people. Therefore, it was necessary to popularize a new pretender to the throne of the shortest possible time and force the people to believe in its love for uh, Bravosky, his chosen one. Talking about Putin here, right? It uh, goes on to say here, this war was provoked. Oh, okay, now they're going to get. Oh, let me. I need to finish reading this one part here. The the. Uh, inventive Boris Abramovich solved this problem too with the Second Chechen War by September of 1999. When the Second Chechen campaign was just picking up momentum, Asian Mashkadov, the uh, then leader of the independent Chechnya, announced an interview in the newspaper Moskovsky uh, Cos uh, Cosmolets. This war was provoked by Bravosky, he says. The war was planned long ago. One needs to search for its cause above all in Moscow. That's where the dirty political games are taking place around the question of who will become Yeltsin's successor. So he was actually sp spilling the beans. The former Chechnyan uh, president there was spilling the beans that something was going on far more sinister than what the people were paying attention to. So we get down here and uh, and we find out after the successful completion of the presidential campaign, according to uh, Br Br uh, Brzezowski's scenario, bad sponsor turned out to be to be too compromising for the new Russian president, behind whose back more and more dissatisfied murmurs on his score could be heard. When the pragmatic politician Vladimir Putin declared war on Jewish oligarchs, sounds like a great righteous leader, right? 
Watch what happens. Bravatsky and Gunsky, loud and prolonged applause erupted from the increasingly joyful called healthy prag uh, pragmatism. The real reason for the president's raid on the best representatives of Russia's Jewish oligarch circles was the strong-willed decision of Chabad. We're talking about the Chabad Lubavitch Organization of Jews which was able in this way to get rid of the overly active Gunsky and Bravatsky. They had no idea. They might have been uh, clapping over there with all their little excitements and shouting and everything, but Chabad was about to put them out the door. Loud and prolonged applause erupted from the increasingly joyful public. The Russian president acquired the reputation of an up and promising but fair strongman. So you see, they built an illusion around Putin because he established, uh, he challenged the establishment, just like he's doing right now. He said he's fighting against a new world order. He's fighting against the Jewish bankers of the West, the elite of the world that has established all these banking cartel, or you know, the the uh, the IMF, international monetary funds, etc. And in a way, he is because Chabad is who pulls Putin's strings. And Chabad is working on a new world order, which puts Israel at the head. And that's why Netanyahu is creating a theocracy in the nation there that is subject, or that he is subjugated to the Chabad organization to bring about global dominance. It is truly Gog has gathered together all of his friends for a battle that is about to happen and already being waged in a war right before our very eyes. Let's continue on. No one guessed that behind Putin's strong-willed decision stood someone else's invisible will, subjugating yet another faceless creature whose only and very dubious virtue was his so-called healthy pragmatism. What had these two done to anger Chabad? Because after all, those two there are Jewish guys, right? Well, let's see what it says here. In Bravatsky's case, we can find the answer in the Jewish Observer. And I'll cite the answer of Bishop Kirill of Metropolitan Smolensk in Kaliningrad to question he was asked concerning the hero now under this discussion. And save a little bit of this. I'll read the part that I've highlighted. I asked him about the conflict between uh, Gunsky and Bravatsky, which was shaking the foundation of public life. Could Israel somehow get involved? After all, they're your people. To this, Netanyahu's aide answered, Excuse me? Gunsky is ours, but Bravatsky is yours. Apparently, he was referring to Bravatsky's baptism of the Orthodox Church that took place in 2002. Or at least, that's, I'm sorry, the Jewish Observer, that's when they wrote the article, not when that baptism took place. All right, so we move on down a little further. I think there is an even more obvious explanation. Gunsky and Bravatsky, whose personal feud was being played out in TV screens all over the nation on the channels which they controlled, NTV and ORT, had simply become an embarrassment for the Jewish power structure. The feud brought the reality of Jewish power out in the open, which is a big no-no, of course, writes Mr. Hudo. All right, going down a little further. Therefore, the newly backed Christian Bravatsky, relying on his chosen ethnicity, decided to simultaneously make a splash in the Jewish religious circles. But he forgot to take care of one thing into or take one thing into account: the up, uh, uncompromising Chabad, which had created the Religious Federation of Jewish Communities of Russia, whose establishment Bob had actively helped enable by donating imposing sums for its development doesn't forgive heretics. Now, this is here, uh, the upcoming Chabad. They don't forgive heretics. Mercilessly ridding itself of them and filling the results vacancies with new figures from among its own proper Jews. Here it would be appropriate to mention the advice received from the hero of an old Odessa antidote in Banya, Ivan Amrich. Uh, Either take that cross off your neck or your shorts back on, or put your shorts back on. So Boris Abramovich, when he put on his cross, should have just kept on his shorts. In other words, he should have just stayed Jewish is what they're trying to say. The second Jewish oligarch who suffered, as, uh, as all of them thought from the up, uh, uncompromising but fair President Putin, was uh, 
excuse me, Berezovsky, main rival in unsinkability, Vladimir Alexandrovich Gunsky. What was Gunsky guilty of in the eyes of Chabad? Hmm. See, Vladimir Gavansky founded the Russian Jewish Congress, a secular, notice that, a secular organization, representing the interests of the assimilated Jewry oriented, if one can express oneself thusly toward the idea of the Western Zionism, that powerful structure with its broad ties to the West was the main competitor of Chabad and its brainchild, Fiora in the battle of the influence of Russian Jewry, and most importantly, in its battle for the Kremlin. You see, Chabad crushes anything and everything that gets in its way. It does not matter if, it, if you're Jewish or not, if you are not for the ultra-Orthodox, ascetic lifestyle and way of belief, you are going to be crushed. A good example of that, by the way, and I'll just jump over here just for a moment here and share this with you as well, is a video I did here when I was exposing Trump's ties to the different uh, Russian strongmen, oligarchs that Russia had, two of them, Lev Parnas and Igor Fruman, by the way, uh, of which Trump had very close ties to there, were actually invited to a meeting there, uh, an Orthodox meeting there in, in the United States there, but uh, they could care less about the or, uh, ultra-Orthodox Jewish sect of the Chabad organization and would not contribute to it when they came. And these were millionaires. Oddly enough, they ended up in prison. Just something I would throw in there for you to think about as we continue on down on this. All right. By placing at its disposal heavy artillery in the form of Bob, a family member of Chabad, in effect, secured the support of the family in deciding the Jewish question. In its favor, the following fact is extremely telling in this regard. In November of 2000, the founding convention of the Federation of Jewish Communities of Russia took place in Moscow. And at this event, the Chabad rabbi, Beryl Lazer, which, by the way, is the chief rabbi of Russia right now, who is now head rabbi of Russia and the CIS, was elected to lead the organization. Five hours after Lazar's election, the chairman of the REC, Vladimir Gunsky, was arrested and taken to uh, Broskaya prison. Just like those two guys that I mentioned to you that Trump was connected to. By provoking Gunsky and Bravosky into a mutual conflict, but remaining all the while in the shadows, Chabad killed two birds with one stone, discrediting Russia's main incorrect Jews who portray, who protracted feud was beginning to be uh, to seriously destabilize the whole country. The events of that time were very neatly summoned up by Victor um, Chernadrin, who, with his usual bluntness, announced, two Jews fight and all Russia trembles. True, this commentary relates only to the visible one sits there quietly having, so, so, excuse me, only to the visible side of the conflict. A more accurate characteristic of what happened can be given in by rephrasing the well-known anti-Semitic saying, when two Jews fight, a third one sits there quietly, having sat there quietly for the required length of time. Chabad began to call on Russia's head pragmatist to deliver long-suffering Russia from Jewish troublemakers, from whom allegedly issued the main threat, not only Russian Jewry, but to the peace and quiet of the country as a whole. So yes, while Putin is sitting there ridding the country of what they consider to be all these bad Jews, these Jews that are controlling Russia and the, and the oligarchs there, all the while he was propping up Chabad and his neck was being turned at their beck and call. By the way, don't forget, Vladimir Putin was the cousin. He is the second cousin of the man that Hudo flew to Israel with, uh, what was his name there, Rabanovich, I believe, no, Radishkovich. That's Putin's second cousin. So Putin is Jewish as well. That Vladimir Putin did his best for Russia even more, not only rid her long-suffering uh, Rus and the Jewish plague, but also effectively put an end to the schism within Russian Jewry. By placing the ladder of Chabad's reliable hands, expelled two Jewish troublemakers from the Kremlin, Politburo, uh, replacing them with the super quiet Chabad, and contributed humanitarian aid to the West in the form of 
Bereze Gus, uh, Gus Billions, thus boosting Russia's image as a rich and generous country. And the main thing, by releasing two of the Jews who have bled Russia dry in the past decade, Putin cleared the Russian people of any accusation of anti-Semitism and raised its prestige in the eyes of the whole civilized world. Take that, Joseph Vissarionovich. Uh, and from that time on, Putin has been the loyal friend of Chabad and always follows its quiet, wise advice. As the Jewish press glowingly reports, Putin invites the Chabad rabbis to the Kremlin a minimum of once a month. In this part here, I want to just point out a couple of things, but the main thing in Rabbi Lazar's opinion is that President has healthy understanding of the Russian future and the role of religion in society. This gets into Lev Liev, was also present at the Kremlin meeting. By the way, Lev Liev was very connected to uh, Donald Trump. Uh, he is the uh, multi-billionaire uh, Russian oligarch, actually Ukrainian oligarch there, uh, that has made his million in blood diamonds. Uh, with regards to the last quote, I must add that all of these rabbis from the number of Russian cities uh, to the very last one are Chabad people and uh, the group of the respected guest of the Kremlin was headed by the wise mentor with whom were already acquired the super quiet Burl Laser. Uh, I'm not going to continue going down through all of this here. I'll include a link for you to be able to read this for yourself. But what I do want to share with you uh, here is some excerpts here of what um, is said here by uh, Hudo and uh, it is translated here for you and the reason being on these things here is because if there's going to be a war wherein Russia would be willing to attack Israel it will be because Chabad has ordered it to do so as I brought out to you in the Dead Sea Scrolls remember Gog and all his gathering that has gathered to him the ancient Gog is part of the Khazarian Empire. And they are the sons of darkness. We're going to go back to that in just a moment here, but first let me play some of these little clips here for you here. Now he's actually using a book. There's Menachem Schneerson right there. Uh, and he's going to show you how well craftily this book is laid out. And the way they do a little cutouts, inserts there, to where every time you turn a page, you see Menachem Schneerson's face on there going all the way down till you get to the last page there. And when you get to that last page, there's no more cutouts. His, his face is there along with this other guy here on the other side there. And, of course, the Twin Towers. And let me just play that for you. So let's listen to what he says here. I want to show you here from the building indicated, 89 year, that is... About the time when no one for a second, even where the thought arose that the areas of life, well, hello, volleyball of the ninth year, uh, he's talking He's talking about the Twin Towers. Nobody, in other words, nobody had any clue that the Twin Towers were going to go down. A central love of it, you're here. Very bad paper on this grove. The layout for now, yes. Everything for now, well, put everything. Soviet power of the micros and the protocols of the wise men of Zion. This is not how it can be planned. I'm about to the nearest while my protocol, 89, already had a layout and background. Therefore, this is how Moscow was depicted. And even in the same league, it's not like that, a story about what was done. I will now demonstrate here. It is made from the next. He's going to show you the cutouts now. Let's try shows. The window is cut everywhere. See the windows and the pages there. So you always see many times near. So you see that? Look everywhere from the window. Such a technical novelty that was time for my canal. It went and went for a cat. These are cats at the edge. Childhood. And the window stopped. Look. He's going to tell you where it's going to stop at. 
Not so much as farther than the portrait of the rep in the 89th year, she stopped. And in the place where your twin entered, the plane. Talking about the Twin Towers. Now, I don't speak Russian. My wife does, but she's not here to translate this for me more properly there. But the point is, is to show you how that uh, a subliminal message was actually placed inside that video there. I thought you'd like that there. Um, now, this one here, and I'm just trying to remember if I can get to the part about where he talks about Ivanka Trump. Let me see here. И вот тому подтверждение, например, такая статья об его дочери под говорящим названием. Иван Катрон о том, как... So here we go right here. The daughter and the telling of Ivanka Trump about how to combine the role of an Orthodox Jewish mother. Деловой женщин. Хотел бы напомнить, что если в предыдущей публикации просто... Give me one second there. I lost my subtitles when it rebooted there. And uh, we're just about to the end because I, I know it goes so much into this. So I just want to, and I know it can be very confusing as well. So here we go there. The children consider a Jew since she... Okay. It's reported that accepted his uh, ism and the children considered a Jew since she accepted him from here, draw conclusions from about the further behavior of a possible Trump. If he begins to rule, you probably could be convinced that I already then claimed that both candidates under the control of the Jewish community of my daughter were married for a while and converted to Judaism. And now after Trump's victory, I would like to strengthen my evidence base and tell about the fact that Trump's daughter, Ivanka, after all, she didn't just convert to Judaism, she's actually an activist, one of the leaders of the women's movement in Chabad. What is a a hap from, but uh, schematically remind those who don't know this is an ultra-Orthodox sect. This is not a traditional Judaism. This is a sect originated in the 18th century. I'll remind you from the inside thousands of years ago, this sect arose in the 18th century. All right. So he brought that out there. There's so many things that he brings out. Uh, and I don't have time to bring all that out at this point here for you. So I'll put the link to this video here in the description for you to see that. But let's real quick, let's, I want to go back though again to the um, this thing about Gog. And I want to take you back up here and show you. For the battle is yours with the might of your hands. Their corpses have been torn to pieces with no one to bury them. Goliath from Gath, Galliant, uh, giant, you delivered into the hands of David, your servant, uh, for he trusted in your powerful name and not in the sword of the spirit, for the battle is yours. The Philistines you humiliated many times for your holy name by the hand of your kings. Beside you saved us many times, thanks to your mercy and not to our own deeds by which did wrong, nor by our sinful actions, for the battle is yours. And it is from, from you that power comes, and not from our own being. It is not from our might nor our power or hands which performs these marvels except by your great strength, by your mighty deeds. Thus you taught us from the ancient times, saying, now watch this, a star departs from Jacob, a scepter will be raised in Israel, and it will smash the temples of Moab, and it will destroy the sons of Seth, and it will come down from Jacob, and it will exterminate the remnant of the city. The enemy will be its possession, and Israel will perform feats by the hand of your anointed ones. You see, that's speaking about Jesus Christ. That's He is that star. He is that star that comes out of Jacob. But he didn't do that when he came the first time. Think about it. 
By the hand of your anointed ones, seers of the decrees, you taught us times of the wars of your hands to fight to be the glorious over our enemies, to fell the hordes of Belial, the, the seven peoples of the futility. By the hand of the poor, those you saved with the strength of success towards wonderful power, so that a melting heart become a door to hope. You shall treat them like Pharaoh, like the officers of the chariots of the Red Sea. The stricken spirit you shall set aflame like a torch of fire and a straw devouring wickedness without ceasing until the sin has been consumed from old you before an appointed time of the power of your hand against the Kedim and Ashur will fall by the sword of a man, the sword, not a human being will devour it. For you will deliver into to the hands of the poor the enemies of the countries and in the hand of those prone of the dust in order to fail the power one of the nations to return the reward of sin on their guilty heads to pronounce the justice of your truthful judgment every son of man to make an everlasting name for yourself among the people the wars in order to show yourself great holy in the eyes of the remainder of the peoples so that they know you shall carry out sentence on Gog and all his gathering that are gathered to him all right, and then it's a battle from heaven that takes place. Friends, in closing, let me say this. It is truly a supernatural type of battle. We realize that Gog, if you look at what it started off up here in the beginning there, he types the battles like David, David fought Goliath, giants. It talks about the Philistines, giants. You know, the, everything was giants that they were dealing with. And then he likens that to Gog and those that are with him. And then we already, I showed you how that uh, Rabbi Zadok is, is talking about how that they're going to have help from within inside the earth that comes up. Reptilians, giants. And they're creating this war against Israel to build sympathy and to garnish the support of the people. And we know from the book of Revelation, as we already said there, Satan comes out to deceive those people that are on the, on the face of the earth. He goes out to deceive the nations, which are at the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. So see, even the fact that the evangelical ministers that are out there that are teaching you, you got to stand with Israel, you got to stand with Israel, and all the while Israel's making this theocracy that is going to suppress and to behead Christians, yet Christians are out there lifting up the praises of Israel and totally ignoring what's really going on. And they control everything in the world. If I had the time, I would show you China. China, totally controlled by the Chabad organization. Russia, controlled by the Chabad organization. Putin is a Chabadnik himself. And every president of the United States, Chabadniks, all of them signing in the laws, obeying to the T, whatever they're told to do. And yes, at the same time, they can play this part about George Soros and all of them and get rid of the bad Jews because it doesn't matter. After a while, Chabad doesn't like them anyway. Why? Because the Chabad organization, the Pharisees, <laughs> there is actually historical documentation that says that they're the ones that opened up the doors to the second temple to have the Romans come in and kill off those that were against them. The Zadokite priesthood had to be down there at Qumran because they called the Pharisees sons of darkness and that's who these evangelical ministers are supporting, the sons of darkness, the Pharisees of today. Think about it, friends. I know it's a lot of information, and I trust somehow or another this will be a help to you. I'll try to find a way to shorten it so it's not so long. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're listening to Israeli News.